Hey everyone, and welcome back for another deep dive. Today we're going to be looking at something that might hit a little closer to home for everyone, literally. Hmm, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking about buildings. Okay. But not just any buildings. We're going deep on how buildings are going to have to evolve to survive in the future, even thrive. Yeah, you know, this is really interesting when you think about it. Like, all the buildings that we have today, they're not going to cut it in the future. Yeah. Like, we're talking brown buildings potentially losing 80% of their value. 80%? Yeah, that's a huge, huge number. It's going to be a nosedive. That's insane. Like, imagine if you bought a car today and it didn't have air conditioning. Exactly. Or you bought a phone and it didn't have, you know, GPS. Yeah, yeah, you just wouldn't do it. It just wouldn't happen. And that's the point. Right. For the next generation, a truly smart building is going to be just the expectation. Right. It won't be a luxury. So we've got a ton of research here. Yeah, we do. We're talking reports, simulations, expert opinions. We've got a whole stack of, uh, of stuff here to go through. So where do we start? Okay. What's the most pressing issue for building owners right now? So there's this report, it's called Profitability of Sustainable Buildings, Measure, Act, and Invest Now for Future Generations. Wow, what a title. Yeah, it really gets to the heart of the issue, which is sustainability. Okay. If you ignore it as a building owner, you're not just, you know, you're not just doing bad things for the planet, but you're also doing bad things for your business. Okay, so like what are the, the biggest risks we're talking about here? I think you've got to think about things like energy costs. Okay, yeah. Those are only going up. You've got regulations for things like emissions. They're going to get stricter and stricter. And demand for sustainable buildings is only going to grow and grow. Right. So if you're if you're a brown building, you're going to be undesirable, uninsurable, potentially. Wow. So tougher financing, yep. lower property values, maybe even having to pay for a bunch of retrofits just to keep up with the market. Exactly. And you've also got to think about the carbon footprint of your building, that's going to start to have a real impact on the market. So essentially, brown buildings are facing some serious challenges in the future. So what can we do? What are the alternatives? Yeah, well, that's where things get really interesting. The research here presents two different green building scenarios. OK. They were modeled with energy simulations. OK. And the results, they're really something. OK, lay it on us. What makes these green building scenarios so special? Well, for starters, both of these scenarios achieve a pretty drastic reduction in operational carbon. We're talking almost 99%. 99% reduction. Yeah, compared to just a standard building, it's huge. That's almost carbon neutral. So, like, how is that even possible? Well, it's all about using a combination of strategies. Okay. Things like recovering heat from wastewater. Oh, okay, interesting. Using solar walls to preheat fresh air. Right. Using super high efficiency heat pumps. Yeah, okay. So we're talking about some serious tech here. Yeah, yeah, we are. So these things aren't cheap. That's true. The initial investment for these green building scenarios, it is higher. Yeah. But the long-term savings, the simulations show that you're going to be offsetting a lot of that cost. So you're making your money back. Right. And then some. Okay, well, how long have we talked about? It's hard to say exactly. Right. It depends on things like energy prices. Of course. What technologies you use, the building's occupancy. But you've also got to factor in things like government incentives and programs like carbon credits. Carbon credits. So we're saying that a building could actually generate revenue. That's the idea. Wow. If a building is so efficient it's using so little carbon that it actually starts to earn credits, you could sell those. Oh, wow. That's incredible. It is. It's a complete shift in thinking. So we're not just talking about saving money on energy bills. We're talking about a return on investment because mm -hmm. your building is green. Okay. So we've talked about the risks of brown buildings, mm -hmm. the potential financial benefits of going green. But what about the people who are actually in these buildings? Mm -hmm. How do they experience all of this? I mean, a building can be super energy efficient. Yeah. But if it's a miserable place to be, mm -hmm. that doesn't really help anyone. No, absolutely. It doesn't. And that's where the reports that we have here, that's where they really shine. All right. They go beyond just the numbers. Okay. They look at the human impact. They bring in the perspectives from architects and consultants. And what do they have to say? They talk about a mindset shift. Okay. Thinking about buildings less as financial assets more about well-being. Right. Okay. Thinking about things like air quality. Right. Thermal comfort. 
Okay. Access to natural light, even connecting with nature. Okay, so it's about creating spaces where people can thrive, not just exist. Exactly. So it's not just about the fancy tech. It's about a better experience for everyone inside the building. Yeah, and the great thing is that this applies to new and existing buildings. Oh, oh okay. Retrofits, new construction, doesn't matter. This is really exciting stuff. Yeah, it is. I feel like we've only just scratched the surface. We have. What else is in these reports? There's this one fascinating aspect that we need to talk about. Okay. It's the impact of the materials we use. The materials. Yeah. And I think you'll be really surprised by just how much of a difference a single material can make to a building sustainability. Ooh, I'm intrigued, but I think we're going to have to save that for part two of this deep dive. <laughs> make sure to stick around. You won't want to miss it. Welcome back. So... I'm excited to jump into this part. You know, it's easy to get caught up in the big picture of sustainable buildings. Yeah. But uh, but sometimes I think the most impactful changes come from focusing on the details. Okay. And that's what we're going to do now. We're going to zoom in on this case study. Okay. It's from this Profitability of Sustainable Buildings report. Mm -hmm. And it really gets into the nitty gritty. Okay. I like a good case study. So what are we looking at? What kind of building? So this one focuses on a residential building, 320 units. Okay. With some commercial space on the ground floor. It's here in Montreal. Local. Yeah, local. It was built back in 2018, so relatively new. Okay, so not some old building. Yeah. What did they do? Did they, like, tear the whole thing down? No, no, no. They used the existing building as their uh, baseline. They called it the reference building. Right. And they used software to model different scenarios energy modeling software. Oh, okay. So they're basically running experiments. Yeah, virtual experiments. To see how different strategies would affect the building. Exactly. In terms of energy and carbon footprint. Yeah, they looked at things like heating, cooling, ventilation, hot water production. Okay, so like all the big energy users. Yeah, exactly. Because if you can make small improvements there, right. that's where you get the biggest impact. Makes sense. Okay, what kind of scenarios were they testing out? So they focused on optimizing those systems we just talked about. Okay. And one of the key things they looked at was heat recovery. Okay. Both scenarios actually had this system that would recover heat from wastewater. Wastewater? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Like using waste energy to power essential systems. Exactly. I like that a lot. It's really smart. What else did they do? The other thing they used were these high efficiency heat pumps. Right. You know, we've talked about heat pumps before. Yeah, like two-way air conditioners. Yeah, exactly. And they're really becoming super popular, yeah. especially in climates like ours where yeah. we've got these cold winters. Mm -hmm. But what's special about these ones is that they can operate really efficiently even when it gets below freezing. Oh, okay. So they've got heat recovery, super efficient heat pumps. What else did they look at? Well, one of the cool things was the flexibility. They showed how buildings could switch between different energy sources. Oh, like electricity and natural gas. Yeah, depending on things like energy pricing, whether the grid was available, stuff like that. So like the building's making decisions in real time. Yeah, it's like right. it has a brain right, that's yeah. optimizing everything. Okay, that's amazing. So how did this affect their environmental impact? The results, well, both scenarios got to almost 99% reduction in carbon emissions. Really? 99%? <laughs> yeah, compared to the reference building. To almost carbon neutral. That's incredible. How do they do it? Well, a big part of it was switching to electric systems okay. that are powered by renewable energy, hydroelectricity here in Quebec. Right, okay. So it really reduces that reliance on fossil fuels. Okay, so it's not just the tech, it's the source of the energy as well. Yeah, yeah, you got it. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. What about the financial risk? We talked about resilience before. Yeah, that's a great question. How do these scenarios measure up? The report shows that... Um, that these energy efficient scenarios are actually way more financially beneficial. Okay. Because we're going towards a low carbon economy. And right. so buildings with higher carbon footprints are going to end up costing a lot more. Right. right? You're going to yeah. see things like carbon taxes, yeah. higher energy prices, even problems getting financing and insurance. It's like those brown buildings. They're yeah. becoming stranded assets. Yeah. You got it. Nobody wants to be stuck with them when the regulations change. Okay, so how do these green scenarios compare? Well, they're designed to thrive in a low-carbon future. Go. They've already aligned with all the emerging regulations. Mm. They have lower operating costs, okay. and they're way more flexible. So it's about making smart choices, not just for the environment, but for your wallet, too. Exactly. Okay, but I'm still stuck on that 
99% emissions reduction. Yeah. That seems almost too good to be true. Is there a catch? Well, we're only talking about the operational emissions here. Right. The ones that come from running the building. Yeah. There's another piece to this puzzle. Oh, okay. Embodied carbon. Right. The carbon emissions from the materials used to actually build the building. So even a super efficient green building can still have a large carbon footprint. That's the problem. And that's where this case study gets interesting. They didn't just analyze the operational carbon. Okay. They also did something called a life cycle analysis to figure out the embodied carbon. So they looked at the entire life cycle, cradle to grave. Yeah. What did they find? Well, there's one material that stood out, concrete. Okay, so we're back for the final part of our deep dive into the future of buildings. We've talked about brown buildings. We've talked about operational carbon, all these smart systems, even buildings that are making money. But now it's time to tackle that other carbon elephant in the room, embodied carbon. Yeah, you got it. It's it's something that's often overlooked when people talk about sustainable buildings. Right. But it's super important because even if you have the most energy efficient building in the world, if it took a ton of carbon to produce the materials to build it, you're still contributing to the problem. It's like driving a hybrid car, but the gas you're putting in it mm -hmm. was made in a super polluting way. Yeah, exactly. And that's why this Montreal case study that we've been talking about, that's why it's so fascinating. Okay. They did this detailed life cycle analysis to look at that embodied carbon. Okay, so they were looking at uh, the entire lifespan of the building. From the cradle to the grave, yeah. Yeah. To try to really understand the complete environmental impact. And what did they find? What stood out? Concrete. Concrete. Of course, the backbone of like every building, but... Yeah, not exactly known for being eco-friendly. No, not really. Traditional concrete production, it's a major source of carbon emissions. It can be a huge part of the building's footprint. So are we saying that even a green building is going to have a pretty high embodied carbon because of all that concrete? Well, not necessarily. And this is where things get uh, pretty hopeful, I think. Okay. The report shows that if you switch out traditional concrete for these low carbon alternatives, you could cut the building's embodied carbon by somewhere between 17 and 22 percent. Wow. OK, that's that's a big chunk. Right. So what are these magical low carbon concrete options? Is it like some sci fi material? No, no, it's a there's a bunch of options and they're already out there. One way to do it is to uh, use materials like fly ash or slag. Fly ash, slag, what are those? They're byproducts from other industries. Oh, okay. So instead of just sending them to the landfill, you use them in the concrete. So it's like recycling on a on a huge scale. Yeah, exactly. Another thing you can do is use this type of cement called Portland limestone cement. Okay. And it actually has a way lower carbon footprint than the traditional Portland cement. It performs just as well, if not better. Okay, so we've got these different concrete options. That sounds great. But these sustainable options are often more expensive. Is it actually uh, is it actually worth it financially? Yeah, well, like most things in sustainability, it depends. Right, of course. The cost premium for that low carbon concrete it can vary a lot. Right. It depends on the materials you use, what the local market's like. But when you look at the financial modeling in the report, the findings are interesting. Okay. Yeah. Tell me more about that. Remember, we were talking about how buildings with high carbon footprints. Yeah. They're going to be facing these extra costs in the future. Right. Things like carbon taxes, higher financing costs. Exactly. It's going to get more expensive to own those brown buildings. Yeah, for sure. But if you choose the low carbon concrete right from the start, you can actually save money in the long run. Okay. So it's not just about being green. It's about being smart financially. Right. It's like you're future proofing your building. It's amazing how those two things can actually come together. So I've covered a ton of ground in this deep dive, from brown buildings to green buildings, operational carbon, embodied carbon. What's the key takeaway for everyone listening? What do you want them to walk away with? I think the main thing is that sustainable building practices, they're not just a nice thing to have anymore. They're absolutely crucial. Yeah. And the good news is that a lot of these strategies we talked about today, they're already out there. The tech's ready. The materials are ready. We just need to put them into practice. And that's exactly what this deep dive has been all about, giving everyone the tools and information they need to make a difference. This isn't just about individual buildings. It's about creating better cities, better communities for everyone. Absolutely. So if buildings can become carbon neutral, maybe even carbon positive, what other possibilities are out there? How can we transform our cities and communities? That's something to think about as we wrap up this deep dive. Thanks for joining us.